Qualitative research. Qualitative research involves the use of words and observations as data rather than numbers. It seeks to answer the why question rather than the how question. That is to say that it seeks to gain insight into human behavior, attitudes, motivations, values, and culture in order to explain why people do what they do. While quantitative analysis can provide data to show what people are doing, it generally has more difficulty in establishing causality and thus explaining why they're doing it. Qualitative analysis, on the other hand, typically provides insight into the reasons behind action. Quantitative techniques can model how people behave. Transportation engineers, for example, have been modeling the behavior of drivers in traffic for decades and have used this data and analysis to plan traffic routes, intersections, and the like. But they have difficulty in explaining the overall worldview and approach that motivate and regulate particular behaviors. This can sometimes lead to an inability to predict how people will behave given a certain situation. To use our example of transportation engineering once again, a traffic flow design based on the assumption that drivers will follow traffic signs and rules can be highly efficient and predictable in cultures like the United States where people generally follow traffic rules. But it can be highly inefficient in cultures in developing countries where formal rules are often ignored and drivers seek to solve traffic problems at their own initiative. At the same time, a traffic system where much is left to the initiative and understanding of the driver may lead to tremendous confusion and gridlock in the United States, and yet sometimes works uncannily well in the almost impossible traffic situations, intersections without working lights, carts pulled by animals in the roadways, pedestrians in the streets, and so forth, one sometimes sees in the major cities in these developing countries. Consequently, different rules make different sense in different cultural and societal contexts, despite the fact that a motor vehicle is a motor vehicle anywhere in the world. Cars, roads, traffic lights, etc. are the same. It's the people in different societies that approach driving and traffic with different perspectives and therefore exhibit variations in behavior. Traditional scientific research is usually quantitative, and many people readily recognize various quantitative techniques as being true science, whereas qualitative techniques sometimes appear fuzzy and lack the comfort and the illusion of certainty provided by quantitative techniques. A biologist studying the behavior of cells in a petri dish, a chemist studying the interaction between two compounds, and a physicist bombarding an atom with energy do not have to worry about the motivation, attitude, or cultural context of their respective subjects. By looking at how something behaves, they can try to understand why it behaves in that way. The cell, compounds, or atom will behave as they do for mechanistic reasons, because they obviously lack the ability to think and then decide on a course of action. Social science research, on the other hand, has the distinct misfortune of having as its basic unit of analysis the human being. Humans are notoriously difficult to understand because their motivations and subsequent behaviors represent a mix of logic and emotion modulated by an almost limitless set of factors ranging from their upbringing and diet to their culture, religion, profession, and life experiences. Understanding and analyzing human thought processes and motivation, or how ethnic, religious, or professional cultures affect perception and thinking, cannot in most cases be effectively carried out using traditional quantitative techniques. But this does not mean that adopting a qualitative approach means abandoning the scientific method. Quite the contrary. While it may not be possible to conduct replicable experiments when dealing with human beings in social situations, 
Qualitative analyses do require a rigorous approach to gathering and analyzing data, precisely because findings can rarely be replicated, and thus must be rigorously produced and analyzed through fully transparent processes. Cataloging what and how the research was conducted is essential in order to enhance the credibility of the findings. Good research in the qualitative context consists of capturing data through a well-thought-out process that's then analyzed through a clear and logical method. The entire process must be rigorously cataloged and described, including providing the logic behind decisions made with respect to data capture and analysis. While rigor and transparency are critical in all cases, there's not one, but rather several, methods for conducting qualitative research. The use of a given method will depend on the nature of the research questions, the data that are available or obtainable on the subject, and the research products desired. In qualitative analysis, data usually come in the form of texts, narratives, or sometimes from observations. These data can come from interviews, open-ended questionnaires, discussions, observed interactions and behaviors, personal accounts of experiences, or documents ranging from letters, diaries, or works of literature, to press reports, official government documents, and academic studies. The first step in the research process is to understand the nature of the data and determine whether or not it is likely to shed insight on the motivations and behaviors of individuals, groups, organizations, or countries. In short, whatever the particular unit of analysis is in the given research project. The data chosen have to be relevant to the motivation, thought process, or behavior being studied. For example, during the Cold War, Western intelligence officers and academics were keenly interested in understanding the thinking and motivations behind the behavior of the Soviet leaders and institutional actors in order to understand their past and present actions and especially to try to predict future ones. Since the Soviet Union was a closed society and precious little independent journalistic or other information came out of Moscow, Western spooks and scholars regularly conducted textual analysis of the major Soviet newspapers. These newspapers certainly did not represent independent journalism. They were controlled by different institutional masters answering to different members of the Soviet Politburo, some to the central Soviet government, some to the Communist Party, some to the regional Soviet governments, some to the Communist Party's youth wing, etc. By conducting a close analysis of the type of language used and the descriptions and editorial slant, analysts could sometimes gain insight into internal frictions and pressures within the Soviet system between institutions and the political leaders running them. Needless to say, drawing conclusions from such analyses of newspapers requires employing a logical and methodical approach that needs to be tested against external events to validate that approach. In other words, for example, if an analyst saw indications in an influential Soviet newspaper that a member of the Politburo was falling out of favor, and then that person was subsequently removed, demoted, kicked upstairs, or exiled to Siberia, this would be an indication that that particular newspaper and the information that it contained may be a credible source of intelligence. The second step in the process is to determine what the analysis is supposed to uncover. This involves developing a set of research questions and then determining how the data might be analyzed in order to answer those questions. Analysis can focus on a particular topic, time period, or issue of interest, or it can focus on an individual group or particular case. It's also possible to combine the approaches and do a little of this and a little of that. For example, if research was being conducted on how people behave during natural disasters, 
and the data being used consisted of interviews with disaster survivors and press stories of individuals coping with these disasters, then the analysis could focus on the individual. If the research objective was to explain what individuals in such situations may think or feel. Alternatively, the analysis could focus on specific groups such as the elderly, minorities, religiously active persons, etc., in terms of how those groups functioned, if the objective was to explain group motivations and behavior. Of course, if one wanted to understand the motivations and thinking of a government agency in the context of dealing with disasters, data coming from interviews of ordinary citizens and press accounts of how ordinary citizens dealt with disasters would not be relevant to the focus of the analysis. Once data have been obtained and it's been decided how to use those data in terms of what the analysis will focus on, and how this will further the research objectives. The third step of the process involves categorizing the data by organizing them into clear categories or identifying themes in the data. This is a critical phase because the researcher must organize the data in a way that allows insight into the subject being studied. Categories or themes can be determined ahead of time and then the data can be plugged into those categories or themes as appropriate, or categories or themes can emerge from the data as they're being assessed depending on whether one is using a deductive or inductive approach to research. For example, if the researcher is interested in understanding what motivates people to report suspicious activity to the police, and the data that are available come from the recordings of phone calls to tip lines, then the researcher could decide to categorize the data based on things such as whether the subject sounded male or female, their accents indicating an individual's regional or ethnic association, the type of terminology they use to describe the suspicious activity, the degree to which they seemed hesitant to provide the information, or the researcher could decide to just listen to the calls without any formal preconceptions and then allow patterns to emerge that can constitute categories in which to group the calls or the callers. A deductive approach involves looking at broad phenomena or theories and then trying to deduce specific insights whereas an inductive approach involves trying to extrapolate general trends from specific data points. To put this another way, if we want to understand why a particular individual becomes a criminal, we can use deductive reasoning and look at a variety of theories of criminal behavior, classical, neoclassical, evolutionary, psychoanalytic, or one of the many theories based on social determinism, in order to try and explain what has caused that individual to exhibit criminal behavior. Zone theory, which is a form of social determinism, argues that an individual becomes a criminal because of geographic and physical factors having to do with where he or she lives in a city, in terms of zones, residential or industrial. Trying to explain why someone became a criminal based on where he or she lives or grew up is a form of deductive reasoning. Of course, one would then have to test that against reality by conducting a study to see if a statistically significant number of criminals live or grew up in zones that were more conducive to criminal behavior. One would also need to try and prove that competing explanations were less valid. For example, one might argue that criminality is a learned behavior based on a competing social deterministic theory known as interactionism, and that people who live in certain zones associate with each other, and hence geography and the physical environment per se, are not the causal factor in criminal behavior. Inductive reasoning would involve studying the life story of one or more individuals that exhibited criminal behavior and trying to see if there are commonalities in those individuals' life experiences that would seem to suggest a broader principle. 
If a series of criminals from the same city are being studied, and all come from the same urban zone, one might then extrapolate that geography and the physical features of a given location play an important role in creating the conditions for criminal behavior. Assuming, as noted earlier, one could discount other variables such as the individual learning certain traits by close association with other criminals. As you can see from the above example, one could come up with zone theory using either deductive or inductive reasoning because the objective in both is to come up with and validate causal explanations for various phenomena. The next step in the process is to identify patterns in themes or categories, connections within or between themes or categories or relationships. To use the example from the previous slide, if certain people mention on their phone calls to the tip lines that they feel their neighborhood is unsafe, and those people also tend to primarily file reports on suspicious vehicles instead of loitering pedestrians, this may lead to some insight as to what people who feel more attached to their neighborhoods tend to fear more acutely, and what may motivate them to act on those fears and report on suspicious activities. The final step in the process is to interpret the data, now organized into useful categories, based on your research objectives. In other words, Understanding how the data and the analysis of that data have produced new insights on the phenomenon being studied. Just presenting the research findings is not enough. Those findings need to be explained and put into the context of the overall research project so that the reader can understand their relevance and they can be used to support the project's final conclusions. It's important to bear in mind that the findings of qualitative analysis will be harder to generalize across a larger population because qualitative analysis necessarily focuses on a much smaller pool of subjects than quantitative analysis, where large group studies are almost a necessity. Since qualitative analysis focuses more on individual motivations and thought processes, and factors impinging on those thought processes, they're much more focused on the trees than on the forest. What one gains in focus and clarity on individual trees, one loses in terms of understanding the nature of the larger forest. Research is a trade-off, and the choice of a given technique always means a loss as well as a gain.